Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about how dogs came from wolves. I just happened to be dog sitting for my brother and his family. They went away for a vacation and I got the dog for about seven, eight days. And I thought, hey, let me look up uh, how dogs came from wolves. I've always been fascinated by it. I've actually done a deep dive here and there throughout my life, you know, and I thought it'd be a good time. As always with these podcasts, I'll put the link for the article or articles if I read more than one, and I'll put them in the description. I usually read the article word for word. I give credit when it's available, and I'll um, interject maybe here and there, but something like this, I'll probably just, uh, you know, get through and then. Maybe look at another one. Because it was two different articles that were interesting to me. I have a great love for all animals. Particularly dogs. Even though one bit me and fucked me up when I was younger. Um, there's just something special about dogs. And as much as I love cats. And I love cats so much. When you look at a cat and you look at tigers and stuff. It really gives you this um, wonderment. Uh, I don't get that same wonderment looking from dogs to wolves or although they're fascinating also. Maybe if they were like dire wolves, you know? Because these tigers and stuff, they're just so big and awesome, beautiful. So, you know, I love all animals in general, but dogs are just, in my opinion, the best companions, and maybe these articles will give us a little bit of insight into why. So the first one, I don't know, I don't know if I'll read two, but as I said, the first one is from the Smithsonian Magazine. SmithsonianMag.com Science Nature, okay? The article is, How Accurate is Alpha's Theory of Dog Domestication? Now, Alpha is a show. We'll get it. Just a little quick thing to get you into it. Who is it? By? Oh, by Brian Handwerk from SmithsonianMag.com All right. Uh, let's begin. Long ago, before your four-legged friend best friend learned to fetch tennis balls or watch football from the couch, his ancestors were purely wild animals in competition, sometimes violent, with our own. So how did this relationship change? How did dogs go from being our bitter rivals to our snuggly, fluffy pooch pals? The new drama, Alpha, there's a link for that, I guess it's a new show, I, didn't, I haven't watched it, answers that question with a Hollywood tale, get it, tale, it's spelled tail, like a dog's tail, of the very first human-dog partnership. Europe is a cold and dangerous place 20,000 years ago when the film's hero, a young hunter named Kida, is injured and left for dead. Fighting to survive, he foregoes killing an injured wolf and instead befriends the animal, forging an unlikely partnership that, according to the film, launches our long and intimate bond with dogs. Just how many nuggets of fact might be sprinkled throughout this prehistoric fiction? We'll never know the gritty details of how humans and dogs first began to come together, but beyond the theater, the true story is slowly taking shape. As scientists explore the real origins of our oldest domesticated relationship and learn how both species have changed along canines' evolutionary journey from wolves to dogs. When and where were dogs domesticated? Pugs and poodles may not look the part, but if you trace their lineage far enough back in time, all dogs are descended from wolves. Gray wolves and dogs diverged from an extinct wolf species some 15 to 40,000 years ago. There's general scientific agreement on that point, and also with evolutionary anthropologist Brian Hare's characterization of what happened next. The domestication of dogs was one of the most extraordinary events in human history, Hare says. But controversies abound concerning where a long-feared animal first became our closest domestic partner. Genetic studies have pinpointed everywhere from south southern China to Mongolia to Europe. Scientists cannot agree on the timing either. Last summer, Research reported in Nature Communications published likely dates for domestication further back into the past, suggesting that dogs were domesticated 
just once at least 20,000, but likely closer to 40,000 years ago. Evolutionary ecologist Krishna R. Uh, Verama, <laughs> I'm sorry, of Stony Brook University and colleagues sampled DNA from two Neolithic German dog fossils, 7,000 and 4,007 years old, respectively. Tracing genetic mutation rates in these genomes yielded the new date estimates. We found that our ancient dogs from the same time period were very similar to modern European dogs, including the majority of breed dogs kept as pets, explained Dr. Ver Rama in a release accompanying the study. This suggests, he adds, that there was likely only a single domestication event for the dogs observed in the fossil record from the Stone Age, and that we also see with live well, we also see and live with today. <laughs> End of story? Not even close. In fact, at least one study has suggested that dogs could have been domesticated more than once. By the way, as I'm doing this to fucking dogs right here, and it's trying to bother me, researchers analyze mitochondrial DNA sequences from remains of 59 European dogs. Is, is that like the force? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm also stoned. <clears throat> of 59 European dogs aged 3,000 to 14,000 years, and the full genome of a 4,800-year-old dog that was buried beneath the prehistoric mound monument at Newgrange, Ireland. Ireland. Comparing these genomes with many wolves and modern dog breeds suggested that dogs were domesticated in Asia at least 14,000 years ago, and their lineages split some 14,000 to 6,400 years ago into East Asian and Western Eurasian dogs. But because dog fossils apparently older than these dates have been found in Europe, the authors theorized that wolves may have been domesticated twice though the European branch didn't survive to contribute much to today's dogs. Gregor Lawson, director of the Wellcome Trust Paleogenomics and Bioarchaeology Research Network at Oxford University, suggests that the presence of older fossils in both Europe and Asia and the lack of dogs older than 8,000 years in between those regions supports such a scenario. Quote, our ancient DNA evidence, combined with archaeological record of early dogs, suggests that we need to reconsider the number of times dogs were domesticated independently. Maybe the reason there hasn't been a consensus about where dogs were domesticated is because everyone has been a little bit right, Lawson said in a statement accompanying the study. By the way, a lot of these words and people's names are highlighted in blue, which when you check out the article, you can go and check out the lead to other things. The many interbreedings of dogs and wolves also muddy the genetic waters. Of course, such events happen to be happen to the present day, even when the dogs in question are supposed to be stopping the wolves from eating livestock. That's pretty crazy, right? How did dogs become man's best friend? Perhaps more intriguing than exactly when or where dogs became domesticated is the question of how. Was it really the result? of a solitary hunter befriending an injured wolf? That theory hasn't enjoyed much scientific support. One similar theory argues that early humans somehow captured wolf pups, kept them as pets, and gradually domesticated them. This could have happened around the same time as the rise of agriculture, about 10,000 years ago. The oldest fossils generally agreed to be domesticated dogs date to about 14,000 years, but several disputed fossils more than twice that age, may also be dogs, or at least they're no longer entirely wolf ancestors. And that disputed fossils thing is also highlighted. You can go, we can go check it out. Some more recent genetic studies suggest that the date of domestication occurred far earlier. A different theory has gained the support of many scientists. Survival of the friendliest suggests that wolves largely domesticated themselves among hunter-gatherer people. 
And this is interesting because there's an article I read about these wolves that are domesticating themselves there, like rural neighborhoods. I'll continue. Uh, quote, that the first domesticated animal was a large carnivore who would have been a competitor for food. Anyone who has spent time with wild wolves would see how unlikely it was that we somehow tamed them in a way that led to domestication, says Brian Hare, director of the Duke University Canine Cognition Center. <laughs> Duke Canine Cognition Center. But Hare notes the physical changes that appeared in dogs over time, including splotchy coats, curly tails, and floppy ears, follow a pattern of process known as self-domestication. It's what happens. Oh, oopsie, sorry. It's what happens when the friendliest animals of a species somehow gain an advantage. Friendliness somehow drives these physical changes, which can begin to appear as visible byproducts of this selection in only a few generations. As I said, this was a wolf, the wolf thing. Man, I should have fucking... Uh, maybe I do some real work. <laughs> Quote, Evidence for this comes from another process of domestication, one involving the famous case of domesticated foxes in Russia. Foxes, that's what it was. Damn it. This experiment bred foxes who were comfortable getting close to humans. But researchers learned that these comfortable foxes were also good at picking up on human social cues explains Lori Santos, director of the Canine Cognition Center at Yale University. I'm going to make a fucking superhero team, okay? And they're going to be dogs, and they're going to be part of the Canine Cognition Center. All right. The selection of social foxes also had the unintended consequence of making them look increasingly adorable, like dogs. Hair adds that the m most wolves would have been fearful and aggressive towards humans, because that's the way most wolves behave. But some would have been friendlier, which may have given them access to human hunter-gatherer foodstuffs. Quote, These wolves would have had an advantage over other wolves, and the strong selection pressure on friendliness had a whole lot of byproducts, like the physical difference we see in dogs, he says. This is self-domestication. We did not domesticate dogs. Dogs domesticated themselves. End quote. <laughs> A, sh a study last year provided some possible genetic support for this theory. Evolutionary biologist Brigitte von Holtz of Princeton University and colleagues suggest that hypersocial behavior may have linked out two species and zero in on a few genes that may drive that behavior. Quote, generally speaking, dogs display a higher level of motivation than wolves to seek out prolonged interactions with humans. This is the behavior I'm interested in, she says. Von Holt's research shows that the social dogs she tested have disruption to a geno uh, genomic region that remains intact in more aloof wolves. Interestingly, in human genetic variation in the same stretch of DNA causes williams buren syndrome a condition characterized by exceptionally trusting and friendly behaviors. Mice also become more social if changes occur in these genes, previous studies have discovered. The results suggest that random variations to these genes, with others yet unknown, must have played a role in causing some dogs to first cozy up with humans. We were able to identify one of the many molecular features that likely shape behavior, she adds. How have dogs changed since becoming our best friends? Though the origin of the dog-human partnership remains unknown, it's becoming increasingly clear that each species has changed during our long years together. The physical differences between a basset hound and a wolf are obvious, but dogs also change in ways that are more than skin or fur deep. One recent study shows how by bonding with us and learning to work together with humans, dogs may have actually become worse at working together as a species. Their pack lifestyle and mentality appear to be reduced and is far less prevalent than in wild dogs than it is in wolves. But Yale's Laurie Santos says dogs may have 
compensated in other interesting ways. They've learned to use humans to solve problems. Several researchers have presented dogs and wolves with an impossible problem, e.g. a puzzle box that can't be opened or pulling a tool that stops working, and have asked how these different species react, Santos explains. Researchers have found that wolves try lots of different trial and error tactics to solve their problem. They get at it physically, but at the first sign of trouble, dogs do something different. They look back to their human companion for help. This work hints that dogs may have lost some of their physical problem-solving abilities in favor of more social strategies. Ones that rely on the unique sort of cooperation domesticated dogs have with humans. This also matches the work showing that dogs are especially good at using human social cues. And I find this fucking fascinating. This is, like, I get, see, I'm a science nerd and so if I love animals, I get goosebumps reading this stuff. This is just amazing to me. And dogs, I think, are ready to interact with humans from birth. If you there's an article on that, I, like I said, I do fucking, I could do like an eight-hour podcast on like one topic if I actually did the work. Well, where was I? <laughs> this also is the dogs are especially good. Okay. The relationship has become so close that even our brains are in sync. Witness a study showing that dogs hijack the human brain's maternal bonding system. When humans and dogs gave lovingly into one another's, one another's eyes, each of their brains secretes oxytocin, a hormone linked to maternal bonding and trust. Other mammal relationships, including those between mom and child or between mates, feature oxytocin bonding. But the human-dog example is the only case which it has been observed at work between two different species. Oh, man. The intimacy of this relationship means that by studying dogs, we may also learn about uh, much about human cognition. Overall, the story of dog cognition evolve, evolution seems to be one about cognitive capacity shaped for a close cooperative relationship with humans, Santos says. Because dogs were shaped to pick up on human cues, our lab uses dogs as a comparison group to test what's unique about human social learning. For example, a recent Yale study found that while dogs and children react to the same social cues, dogs were actually better at determining which actions were strictly necessary to solve a problem, like retrieving food from a container and ignoring extraneous bad advice. Human kids tended to mimic all of their elders' actions, suggesting that their learning had a different goal than their canine companions. We may never know the exact story of how the first dogs and humans joined forces, but dogs have undoubtedly helped us in countless ways over the years. Still, only now may we, may we be realizing that by studying them, they can help us better understand ourselves. And that's the end of this article. Wow, I love this fucking article. Just great stuff and you can like i said when you go through these articles if people listen and they hit the link and they want to read it for themselves some of these articles actually have a listen to the article button this one doesn't but it happens from time to time you'll see plenty of blue highlighted words names and those lead to other links you can look at the report and nature communications this is just awesome dogs i fucking love animals Dogs are the best, in my opinion. I love cats, too. And like I said, I'm, I find them more majestic, you know? But in the everyday life and seeing how we grew as a people, as a species, this is a special thing to happen. And I did a podcast on, uh, what was it called? Wow. I think it was something to the effect of, if you want to feel better, care for your pet. And it's in, it should be in my um, either Foundations for Wellness playlist or my Sciences playlist. And that also kind of has a little bit of um, the well-being, the psychology, and how you treat your dog and such. But what a fabulous just event in history. I have a little bit of a problem with certain dog breeds. And not like, oh, I, I don't like them. But I feel that dogs are bred, which only... Caused them pain. 
If you look at some of the studies you see about pugs and certain dog breeds and the way their bone structure is, it, it hurts me and it bothers me. So yeah, it might be nice that you have this cute little curly dog you could put in your purse and for one reason or another, but I, I, a part of me is sad. I'm not saying everybody should have a big German Shepherd, Akita, Lap, Buckland Labrador, big dog. And um, it has to be close to a wolf. But I think there's a growing consensus amongst the community of, I don't know, veterinarians, um, evolutionary biologists or whatever. There are breeds of dogs that we should not be maintaining their breed. It's They go through such bad effects in certain parts of their life. Anyway, I don't want to bring this down. This was a great fucking article. I love this. I love animals and dogs. Now, what was the other one I had that I thought might be interesting? Because I flagged like two of them. I wasn't sure. Uh, yeah, well, this is a... Uh, let me go through this real quick. Uh, God, I, I fucking destroyed I tried to do this the last time, and I went through it, and I was like, I fucked up everything. All right. A new origin story for dogs. The first domesticated animals may have been tamed twice. Okay, yeah, we got that. Ed Young. Give him credit. This is from The Atlantic. Tens of thousands of years ago, before the internet, before the Industrial Revolution, before literature and mathematics, bronze and iron, before the event of agriculture, early humans formed an unlikely partnership with another animal, the gray wolf. The fates of our two people became braided together. The wolves changed in body and temperament. Their skulls, teeth, and paws shrank. Their ears flopped. They gained a docile disposition, becoming both less frightening and less fearful. They learned to read the complex expressions that ripple across human faces. They turned into dogs. Today, dogs are such familiar parts of our lives, our reputed best friends and subject of many a meme, that it's easy to take them and what they represent for granted. Dogs were the first domesticated animals, and their box heralded the Anthropocene. Anthro <laughs> Anthropocene. <laughs> We raised puppies well before we raised kittens or chickens, before we herded cows, goats, pigs, and sheep, before we planted rice, wheat, barley, and corn, before we remade the world. Quote, remove domestication from the human species, and there's probably a couple of million of us on the planet max, says the archaeologist and geneticist Gregor Larson. Instead, what do we have? Seven billion people, climate change, travel, innovation, and everything. Domestication has influenced the entire earth, and dogs were the first. For most of human history, we're not dissimilar to any other wild primate. We're manipulating our environments, but not on a scale bigger than, say, a herd of African elephants. And then we go into partnership with this group of wolves, and they altered our relationship with the natural world. Lawson wants to pin down their origin, wants to know when, where, and how were they domesticated from wolves. But after decades of dogged effort, he and his fellow scientists are still arguing about the answers. They agree that all dogs, from low slung corgis to towering mastiffs, are the same descendants of wild ancestral wolves. But everything else is up for grabs. Some say wolves were domesticated around 10,000 years ago, while others say 30,000. Some claimed it happened in Europe, others in the Middle East, or East Asia. Some think early human hunter-gatherers actively tamed and bred wolves. Others say wolves domesticated themselves by scavenging the carcasses left by human hunters, or lording around campfires growing tamer with each generation until they became permanent companions. Dogs were domesticated so long ago and have crossbred so often with wolves and each other that their genes are like a completely homogenous bowl of soup, Lawson tells me in his office at the University of Oxford. Quote, somebody goes, what ingredients were added and in what proportions and in what order to make that soup? He shrugs his shoulders. The patterns we see could have been created by 17 different narrative scenarios, and we have no way of discriminating between them. The only way of doing so is to look into the past. Lawson, who is fast-talking, eminently likable, and grounded in both archaeology and genetics, 
has been gathering fossils and collaborators in an attempt to yank the DNA out of as many dog and wolf fossils as he can. Those sequences will show exactly how the ancient canines relate to each other and to modern pooches. They're the field's best hope for getting firm answers to the questions that have hounded them for decades. And already they have yielded a surprising discovery that could radically reframe the debate around dog domestication. So that the big question is no longer when it happened or where, but how many times. On the east edge of Ireland lies new range of 4,800 year old monument that predates Stonehenge and the pyramids of Giza. Beneath its large circular mound and within its underground chambers lie many fragments of animal bones. Among those fragments, Dan Bradley from Trinity College Dublin found the Petros bone of a dog. Press your finger behind your ear, that's the Pertris. It's a bulbous knob of very densely bone that's exceptionally good at preserving DNA. If you try to pull DNA out of a fossil, most of it will come from contaminating microbes and just a few a few percent will come from the bone's actual owner. But if you got a Petros bone, that proportion can be as high as 80%. And indeed, barely found DNA galore within the bone, enough to sequence the full genome of the long dead dog. Larson and his colleague, Laurent Franz, then compared the new Grange sequences with those of almost 700 modern dogs and built a family tree that revealed the relationship between these individuals. To their surprise, the tree had an obvious fork in its trunk, a deep divide between two doggy dynasties. One included all the dogs from Eastern Eurasia, such as Sharp, Pays, and Tibetan Mastiffs. The others include all the Western Eurasian breeds and the New Grange dog. The genomes of the dogs from the Western branch suggest that they went through a population bottleneck, a dramatic dwindling of numbers. Lawson's interprets this evidence of a long migration. He thinks that the two dog lineages began as a single population in the east before one branched off and headed west. This supports the idea that dogs were domesticated somewhere in China. But there's a critical twist. The team calculated that the two dog dynasties split from each other between 6,400 and 14,000 years ago. But the oldest dog fossils in both Western and Eurasian are older than that. Which means... That when those eastern dogs migrated west into Europe, there were already dogs there. To Lawson, these details only make sense if dogs were domesticated twice. Uh, quote, through gritted teeth I said, we're fucking doing dogs. And he said, I'm in. Uh, quote, see? <laughs> now I know why I picked this fucking article too. I don't know if I was going to do two. All right, let's go. Here's the full story, as he sees it. Many thousands of years ago, somewhere in Western Eurasia, humans domesticated gray wolves. The same thing happened independently far away in the east. So at the time, there were two distinct and geographically separated groups of dogs. Let's call them Ancient Western and Ancient Eastern. Around the Bronze Age, some of the Ancient Eastern dogs migrated westward along with their human partners, separating from their homebound peers and creating a deep split in Lawson's tree. Along their travels, these migrants encountered the indigenous ancient western dogs, mated with them, doggy style, presumably, and effectively replaced them. Today's dogs are the descendants of the ancient eastern ones, but today's western dogs and the New Grange one trace most of their ancient ancestry to the ancient eastern migrants. Less than 10% comes from the ancient western dogs which have since gone extinct. This bold story for Larson to endorse, not at least because he himself has come down hard on the paper suggesting that cows, sheep, and other species were domesticated twice. Any claims for more than one needs to be substantially backed up by a lot of evidence, he says. Pigs were clearly domesticated in Anatolia and in East Asia. Everything else is once. Well, except maybe dogs. Other canine genetic experts think that Lawson's barking up the wrong tree. I get it. I'm somewhat overwhelmed, underwhelmed, since it's based on a single specimen, says Bob Wayne from the University of California, Los Angeles. He buys that there's a deep genetic division between modern dogs, but it's still possible that dogs were domesticated just once, creating a large, widespread interbreeding population 
that only later resolved into two distinct lineages. In 2013, Wayne's team compared the mitochondrial genomes, small rings of DNA that sit outside the main set, of 126 modern dogs and wolves, and 18 fossils. They concluded that dogs were domesticated in Europe or Western Siberia between 18,000 and 32,000 years ago. And genes aside, the density of fossils from Europe tells us something, Wayne says. There are many things that look like dogs, and nothing quite like that in East Asia. Peter Peter So Sovalian Peter So Valian and from KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm disagrees. By comparing the full genomes of fifty eight modern wolves and dogs, his team has shown that dogs in southern China are the most genetically diverse in the world. They must have been they must have originated there about thirty three thousand years ago, he says, before a subset of them migrated west eighteen thousand years later. That's essentially the same story Lawson is telling. The key difference is that Savolian Savolanin Savolanin doesn't buy the existence of an independently domestic group of Western dogs. That's stressing the data very much. He says. Those ancient Western dogs might have just been wolves, he says, or perhaps they were an even earlier group of migrants from the East. I think the picture must seem a bit chaotic. He says understandably. But for me, it's pretty clear it must have happened in Southern East Asia. You can't interpret it in any other way. Except you totally can. Wayne does. I'm certainly less dogmatic than Peter, he says. Adam Boyko from Cornell University does too. After studying the genes of village dogs, free-ranging mutts that live near human settlements, he argued for a single domestication in Central Asia. Somewhere near India, or Nepal, and clearly Lawson does as well. Lawson adds that his gene-focused pairs are ignoring one crucial line of evidence, bones. If dogs originated just once, it should be a neat gradient of fossils with the oldest ones at the center of domestication and the youngest ones far away from it. That's not what we have. Instead, archaeologists have found 15,000-year-old dog fossils in Western Europe. 12,500 year old bones in East Asia, and nothing older than 8,000 years in between. If we're wrong, then how on earth do you explain the archaeological data, Lawson says? Did dogs jump from East Asia to West Europe in a week, and then all go back 4,000 years later? No. A dual domestication makes more sense. Oh, for fuck's sake. Mietje. Mietje. Genompre, Minetje Genompre, and an archaeologist from the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences agrees that the bones support Landon Larson's idea. For me, it's very convincing, she says. But even Larson is hedging his bets. When I ask him how strong his evidence is, he says, like, put a number on it. If it was being bold, I'd say it's a 7 out of 10. We lack the smoking gun. Why is this so hard? Of all the problems that scientists struggle with, why has the origin of dogs been such a bitch to solve? Yeah, again. Quote, and then we go into partnership with this group of wolves that altered over. Yeah, that was just a quote. For starters, the timing is hard to pin down because no one knows exactly how fast dog genomes change. That pace, the mutation rate, underpins a lot of genetic studies. It allows scientists to compare modern dogs and ask, how long ago these lineages have diverged in order to build up this many different differences in their genes. And because individual teams use mutation rate estimates that are wildly different, it's no wonder that they've arrived at conflicting answers. Regardless of the exact date, it's clear that over thousands of years ago, dogs have mated with each other, crossbred with wolves, traveled all over the world, and deliberately bred by humans. The resulting ebb and flow of genes and has turned their history to a muddy, turbid mess the homogenous soup that Lawson envisage. Wolves provide no clarity. Gray wolves used to live across the entire northern hemisphere, so they could have potentially been domesticated anywhere within that range, although North America is certainly out. What's more, genetic studies tell us that no living group of wolves is more closely related to dogs than any other, which means that the wolves that originally gave rise to dogs are now extinct. Sequencing Living wolves and dogs will never truly reveal their shrouded past. It'd be, as Lawson says, 
like trying to solve a crime when the culprit isn't even on the list of suspects. The only way to know for sure is to go back in time, he adds. Oh wow, is this going to lead to a time machine? This would be fucking dope. The study informally known as the Big Dog Project was born of frustration. Ah, it's not going to be a time fucking thing. Back in 2011, Lawson was working hard on the origins of domesticated pigs and became annoyed that scientists studying dogs were getting less rigorous papers in more prestigious journals simply because their subjects were that much more charismatic and media friendly. So he called up his long-standing collaborator, Keith Dobney, through gritted teeth, I said, we're fucking doing dogs. And he said, I'm in. That was another quote that, I, that they fucking put up earlier that came out of nowhere, but... All right, that's how I got to ignore those things and then do, just read them right from the article. Right from the start, the duo realized that studying living dogs would never settle that great domestication debate. The only way to do that was to sequence ancient DNA from fossil dogs and wolves throughout their range at different points in their history. While other scientists were studying the soup of dog genetics by tasting the finished product, Lawson would reach back in time to taste it at every step of its creation, allowing him to definitively reconstruct the entire recipe. In recent decades, scientists have become increasingly successful at extracting and sequencing strands of DNA from fossils. This ancient DNA has done wonders for our understanding of our own evolution. It showed, for example, how Europe was colonized 40,000 years ago by hunter-gatherers moving up from Africa, then 8,000 years ago by Middle Eastern farmers, and 5,000 years ago by horse-riding herders from the Russian steppes. Or steeps, what the fuck you call. Everyone in Europe today is a blend of those three populations, says Lawson, who hopes to parse the dog genome in the same way, by slicing it into its constituent, constituent ingredients. Lawson originally envisaged a small project, just him and Dobney analyzing a few fossils, but he got more funding, collaborators, and samples than he expected. It's just kind of metastasized out of all proportion, he says. He and his colleagues would travel the world, drilling into fossils and carting chips of bone back to Oxford. They went to museums and private collections. Parentheses. There was a guy up in York who had a ton of stuff in his garage. They grabbed bones from archaeological sites. The pieces of bone came back to a facility in Oxford called the Paleo Barn. The Paleogenomics and Bioarchaeology Archaeology Research Network. When I toured the facility with Lawson, we wore white overalls, surgical masks, surgical masks, <laughs> oversoles, and purple gloves to keep our DNA and that of our skin microbes away from the precious fossil samples. Lawson called them spacesuits. I was thinking thrift store ninja. In one room, the team shoves pieces of bone into a machine that pounds them with a small ball bearing, turning solid shards into fine powder. They send the powder through a gauntlet of chemicals and filters to pull out the DNA and get rid of everything else. The result is a tiny drop of liquid that contains the genetic essence of a long-dead wolf or dog. Lawson's freezer contains 1,500 such drops, and many more are on the way. It's truly fantastic the kind of data that he has gathered. So Vlainen says, So Vlainen. So Vlainen. <laughs> Savolainen. Savolainen says, True to his roots in archaeology, Lawson isn't ignoring the bones. His team photographed the skulls of some 7,000 prehistoric dogs and wolves at 220 angles each and rebuilt them in virtual space. They can use a technique called geometric morphometrics. <laughs> To see how different features on their skulls have evolved over time. The two lines of evidence, DNA and bones, should either support or refute the double domestication idea. It will also help to clear some confusion over a pecu few peculiar fossils, such as a 36,000 year old skull from Goyette Cave in Belgium. Genome Brie thinks it's a primitive dog. It falls outside the variability of wolves. It's smaller and the snout is different, she says. Others say it's too dissimilar to modern dogs. Wayne has suggested that it represents an aborted attempt at domestication. A line of dogs that didn't contribute 
to modern population and is now extinct. Maybe the Goya hound, Goyette hound was part of Larson's hypothetical ancient western group, domesticated shortly after modern humans arrived in Europe. Maybe it represented yet another separate flirtation with domestication. All these options are on the table, and Larson thinks he has the data to tell them apart. We can start putting numbers on these differences between dogs and wolves, he says. We can say this is what all the wolves at this time period look like. Does the Goyet material fall within that realm, or does it look like dogs from later on? Lawson hopes to have the first big answers within 6 to 12 months. I think it will clearly show that some things can't be right, and will narrow down the number of hypotheses. Boyko says, It may narrow it down to one, but I'm not holding my breath on that. Wayne is more optimistic. Ancient DNA will provide much more definitive data than we had in the past. He says, Lawson convinced everyone of that. He's a great diplomat. Indeed, beyond accommodating DNA in virtual skulls, Lawson's greatest skill is gathering collaborators. In 2013, he rounded up as many dog researchers as he could and flew them to Aberdeen. Why do I know Aberdeen? Aberdeen. I think I have a friend who was born there. I gotta ask Demi. Aberdeen, eh? So he could get them talking. I won't say there was no tension, he says. You go into a room with someone who has written something that sort of implies you aren't doing very good science. There will be tension. But it went away very quickly and frankly, alcohol. Everyone was like, you know what? If I'm completely wrong and I have to eat crow on this, I don't give a shit. I just want to know. Oh, there it goes. And we're done. I'm sorry this was longer than normal, but I fucking love animals and I really, really love dogs. This is fascinating to me. I don't think we would be here in the position that we are, as one of the articles said, because I'm fucking stoned. We would only have about 2 million people on the planet. Or something to that effect. But no, we have 7 billion, 8 billion, right? Of course, the dogs in our relationship and this insight that dogs might have domesticated themselves oh fascinating i hope you enjoyed this hope everybody's doing well my best to you and yours take care everyone